You can understand traditional molecular cloning if you comprehend these five levels. Just like a video game, an increase in level means higher difficulty. The higher the level, the more complex things get. There are more experimental steps, the error probability increases, your results require more validation, and even the vectors get complicated. Molecular cloning in many ways is similar to the game of Tetris. This rectangular EcoR1 site can be split into two L-shaped pieces. The L-shaped pieces are the ends, and two compatible ends can be glued back using ligases to get back the rectangle site. This video is intended to make molecular cloning intuitive, and you can use it to clone any DNA like promoters, regulatory elements, homology regions for CRISPR-Cas9, molecular probes, or even genes. In molecular cloning, you will have to deal with ends. One type is called sticky or cohesive ends. The example of EcoR1 is a 5' prime sticky end because of how the cut was made. You can also have a 3' prime sticky end. The site recognized by the KPN1 enzyme gives you an L-shaped piece that releases a 3' prime overhang. Recognize that the cuts made by restriction enzymes are made between the phosphodiester backbone and not the base pairs. Take this end portion of the KPN1 site. The location of the cut is between the C and C. You can simplify this part by writing the top strand and the bottom strand to have the phosphodiester linkage. And when we say that a cut is made at any restriction site, it is this backbone that is being broken, and not the literal hydrogen bonds between the base pairs. This bond breaking releases the 3' hydroxyl and the 5' phosphate from the phosphodiester bond. Using these phosphates and hydroxyls, we can add details to these tetris blocks. These details will become important in a moment. This also means that when you add a ligase, the hydroxyl and phosphate are brought together using some form of energy source to reconstruct the phosphodiester bond. This reversion to the original rectangle from the L-shaped end is the reversibility in molecular cloning. The base pairing is done by the L-shaped ends, and the joining is done by the hydroxyl and the phosphate. The second type of ends are blunt or flush. Here's an example, which is recognized by EcoR5. Instead of L-shapes, you get flat shapes. With lycase, you can reverse these cuts as well. Blunt cuts are nice to illustrate that breaks are purely a phosphodiester break, because in this case there is no base pairing to think about. Before we dive into the levels of molecular cloning, you should know about a cheat code called blunting. This is the process of converting a sticky end to a blunt end. The enzyme used to do this is a polymerase called Clenau fragment. If you recall DNA replication, you remember Clenau being the large fragment of DNA polymerase 1. Clenau does two things. One is the 3' to 5' digestion, also known as the proofreading activity. The other is the 3' extension, which is just a DNA polymerase activity. It cannot do the 5 to 3' NIC translation. Let's take this sticky end first. For blunting it, you take the digested DNA and add Clenau with the DNTPs. In this example, we are blunting a 5' sticky overhang. The Clenau can assemble at the free 3' hydroxyl and use its extension activity to add DNTPs to this end, in a template-directed manner. This is just basic DNA polymerase activity. After making this short DNA, it falls off since there is no more template. If you look at the other end of this cut, the same thing happens there too. So we have converted 5' overhangs to blunt ends by extending the 3' ends. What about this other overhang? The extension of Clenau only works on the 3' end. You cannot extend on phosphates. This is not how polymerase biochemistry works. But there is another activity. The Clenau can find free 3' ends and start degrading the overhanging single-stranded ends until it hits the double-stranded DNA. The same process happens on the other cut as well. So 3' sticky overhangs are converted to blunts through the exoactivity that chews back the 3' end. This way you can convert any sticky to a blunt end. Alright, level 1 cloning. Even a newborn can do this. Say you get a vector with two sites, A and B. If you have been observant, these are KPN1 and EcoR1 sites. You digest the vector using these two enzymes, and you get L-shaped sticky overhangs. 
All we have done is cut out and discarded a small piece of DNA from the vector A using these two enzymes. Now, maybe you have a second vector containing the same A and B sites, but it contains a DNA of your interest called I, which you would like to insert into vector A. So, you digest vector B with EcoR1 and KPN1, save the insert and discard the rest of the vector. The insert can be ligated with the vector A using a ligase. In ligation, the sticky ends will find each other through base pairing, and the phosphates and the hydroxyls will be used to construct the phosphodiester bond. This way, you have successfully inserted a new piece of DNA into vector A. This simple process of moving an insert from one vector to another is called subcloning. A second possibility is that your DNA of interest is a genomic fragment. You can amplify that using a PCR. But at the end of the primers, you need to add your A and B restriction sites, which will then become part of the final fragment. But this won't work for cloning. When a restriction enzyme binds at the site, it depends on the DNA around it to latch onto for stable binding, and only then can it cut. So there are extra 3-5 to five nucleotides required for the enzyme to cut. Therefore, in addition to the restriction sites, you need to add 3-5 to five nucleotides on the primer. These extra bases can be anything, as long as they do not interfere with the primer dynamics. Now this DNA is ready to be digested and eventually ligated into the vector. These steps assume that your amplified DNA does not have A and B sites internally. If they're present internally, then you will have to get to the level 4 to find the solution. Like subcloning we saw, this is called PCR primer-based cloning. I only expanded one type of sticky configuration. You can expect that any other A and B configuration is also within level 1 as long as A and B sites are recreated in the final vector. Level 2 is relatively simple. The catch is that you have one sticky and one blunt cutter. This means that the insert you are trying to clone also has that blunt site on one end. And the ligation works with the same logic. If you can subclone in level 2, you can also switch the enzyme on your primer and do a level 2 cloning. Simple enough. But why is this level 2 and not a level 1? The interesting bit is that you can choose any blunt cutter instead of EcoR5. Let's switch this with SMA1, which cuts this site in the middle. Now, the resulting fragment has a different blunt cut than the vector A. Since this is a blunt cut, it does not rely on base pairing and you can still ligate this without any problem. But now you have made a chimera site that is half EcoR5 and half SMA1. This is called a dead site. You can also do the PCR cloning using this trick, and the final outcome is the same. Now, the problem is that you cannot simply remove this fragment from the final vector, because one of the sites is dead. Side note, sometimes Chimera site can also form a new site. In this case, it does not. Also, you can form dead sites with sticky ends as well. It happens when you combine isocodomer sites. Level 3 cloning is the start of true complexity. This is where you're using a single type of enzyme. Doesn't matter if you have it once, twice, or more times. For simplicity, say this is EcoR1. This means you will generate the same type of sticky end on both sides. This also means that you're likely to use EcoR1 for subcloning as well. Therefore, the insert also has EcoR1 sites on both sides. The problem with the vector is that both these ends are compatible and therefore the vector itself can close without any insert getting in. This is a high probability scenario since you only need two overhangs to come together for self-ligation, versus you need four overhangs for the insert to be ligated. So how do you prevent this self-ligation? The answer is phosphatase treatment of the vector. Phosphatase enzymes can remove any free 5' phosphates. If you don't have a phosphate, you cannot self-ligate the vector because a phosphodiester bond cannot be formed. The insert has the phosphates. Therefore, the vector can only be closed if the insert is in the middle. But what about the other ends that don't have phosphates which normally are provided by the vector? This type of ligation is a partial ligation. It creates a nicked plasmid, and nicks are normal occurrences. Once this nicked plasmid is inside the bacteria, the plasmid can be fully closed by the bacterial DNA repair enzymes. The final form of this vector has your site A around the insert. Like subcloning, you can do the same thing with PCR as well. 
have identical overhangs on both the forward and reverse primers. Level 3 also works with blunt cutters. Instead of EcoR1, you can switch to EcoR5. Here too, the phosphatase treatment is required to remove phosphates so you don't self-ligate the vector. The insert is also EcoR5 digested, which provides the free 5' phosphate for the ligation. You can do this with PCR-based cloning as well. With blunts, you can go one step further. Rather than EcoR5, you could also use a new blunt cutter like SMA1 for inserts. However, you will end up creating dead sites around the insert in the final vector. This all seems non-trivial, but here's the real issue with level 3. The directionality. You open a vector with A. Insert also has A on both sides. Now imagine having positions X and Y in this insert. You can also ligate this insert with the reversed order, since the ends after a cut are just mirror images. This means when you ligate, you will have two possibilities for inserting the DNA. This means there are two types of final vectors depending on the direction in which insert was ligated. And if you desire a specific orientation, you will have to screen for that final vector. As an example, say you have a coding region and you're trying to insert a promoter in front of that coding region. You don't want the reverse orientation of a promoter because promoters are directional. Sometimes it may be that you want both orientation. Point being that you have to screen for your desired vector containing the desired orientation of the insert. Double insert is another issue. Given that phosphates are present on insert, two insert can ligate to each other and then this double insert can ligate into the vector. This same possibility is valid for single enzyme sticky cuts too. This added complexity for screening makes level 3 complex. Level 4 is the road to unhappiness. It seems simple at first glance because you're using two different sticky cutters just like level 1. The final cuts are incompatible, which prevents self-ligation issues. The cause of unhappiness is that your insert also contains the two A and B sites internally. So when you amplify the fragment via PCR, it carries A and B sites. Digesting this amplicon with A and B means that you will chop your insert into multiple pieces. So you have to do a normal PCR with no overhangs. Or you do a PCR with whatever overhang, but you cannot digest it with A and B. You have this same problem with subcloning, meaning that whatever enzyme you use for the vector cannot be used on the insert. Let's say EcoR5 allows you to remove the insert. You can have EcoR5 or SMA1 or whatever, just not EcoR1 and KPN1. How do you ligate this insert? This doesn't satisfy the rules of Tetris. To overcome this, you have to convert the sticky to blunt ends. I hope you recall our friend Clenau. This enzyme will extend the 5' overhang and chew the 3' overhang. The final result is a blunt finish. Blunt ends have the self-ligation issue we discussed in level 3. So you need phosphatase to prevent self-ligation. Now you can insert the EcoR5 or SMA1 digested insert into the vector. However, level 3 issues regarding the orientation of the insert still persist in level 4. What about PCR cloning? Typically, primers don't come with 5' phosphates, and you need 5' phosphate to attach with the hydroxyl to form the backbone bond. So instead, you take the PCR amplicon and treat it with a kinase enzyme. Kinases add a phosphate to any free 5' end. You don't worry about the phosphate in subcloning because the digestion naturally gives you a phosphate. In PCR cloning, if there is no digest, you don't have a natural phosphate. This kinase-treated insert now can go into the vector. In this style of cloning, it is more likely that you will create a dead site on both sides, combined with the fact that orientation is still an issue. So there is a phosphate removal and a clenau step for subcloning, and a kinase step for the undigested PCR insert that adds complexity to your cloning procedure. Level 5 is very close to making your head explode. We're back to using single enzymes. And let's stick with EcoR1 for simplicity. In level 5, you're interested in making genomic libraries, using fragments that are large. You can make a small-sized genomic library too, but assume you want 100 plus KB fragments as your insert. Take this genome, which can be digested at multiple points. We're using only one enzyme to digest this genome, the EcoR1. 
Let's do some simple math. If you use a 4 base cutter like DPN2 which cuts GATC, then in a genome you have 4 possible bases for each position and 4 fixed positions for GATC. This means you have 4 to the 4 combinations before you find a new GATC. So GATC occurs every 256 bases. If you take a 6 base cutter like EcoR1, you have 4 bases for each position and 6 fixed positions. This means that a new EcoR1 site occurs every 4096 bases. Similarly, an 8 base site like NOT1 will occur every 65,000 bases. So it is easy to get short fragments, but then how do you get the really large ones? The answer is partial digestion of the genome. This means you don't let the reaction occur to saturation. You do this by either reducing the time of reaction or reducing the amount of enzyme. This ensures that not all sites are cut. Say this genome has multiple EcoR1 sites. But if you manipulate the reaction conditions, you can only cut a few of these EcoR1 sites. This will generate a mix of small and large fragments. You can then use pulse field gel electrophoresis to select large fragments. The inserts in this kind of cloning are DNA fragments with different lengths that can be potentially inserted into the vector. This implies that multiple final vectors are possible where each final form carries a unique insert. In level 1 to 4, the vector is generally a PBR322 based vector like PUC19, blue scripts, or maybe some expression vector. Level 5 deals with big genomic fragments and it needs special cloning vectors. You may have heard of PACs, YACs, FOSMIDs, PACs, COSMIDs, and many more. I have videos on these different vectors, both simple ones and complex ones. The playlist on genetic engineering is linked below if you're interested. And I hopefully will see you in one of those videos.